Good evening. I'm Ed Gallagher, President of the American Scandinavian Foundation, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Victor Borgo Hall at the headquarters of the American Scandinavian Foundation, Scandinavia House, the Nordic Center in America, for this, the 2015 Sons to be Wist Lecture by Dr. Olaf Orheim, entitled The Changing Arctic Under U.S. Leadership. It's a particular pleasure to welcome Dr. Orheim back to Scandinavia House, where he has spoken on a number of occasions, and we consider him a great friend. The Arctic has been an important area of interest for the ASF throughout its history. Since 1922, we have supported countless fellowships for scientists of all sorts to, do, to conduct research in the Arctic, and since the opening of Scandinavia House 15 years ago, over 15 programs on the Arct 50 programs on the Arctic have been presented here. Tonight, I'm pleased to announce that, with the guidance of Dr. Orheim, we are currently planning a major international symposium focusing on the Arctic that will take place here at Scandinavia House in spring of 2016 in conjunction with the United States Chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Tonight's lecture is presented with the support of the ASF Sons to Be Wist Fund and dedicated to the memory of Norwegian war hero Gunnar Sons to Be, who was a longtime friend of the Foundation. One of Norway's most honored war heroes, he was decorated by the governments of Norway, Great Britain, and the United States, and most notably was the first non-American to be awarded the United States Special Operations Command Medal. Gunnar Sundstebe's vision was responsible for the establishment of the Museum of the Norwegian Resistance in Oslo, which ensures that future generations will remember the struggle Norwegians fought on their own soil during a time of foreign occupation. In 2001, the ASF honored Mr. Sundstebe with its prestigious cultural award. Three years before that, the Sundstebe Wist Fund was created by ASF trustee Andrew Wist, who is with us this evening, in honor of Gunnar Sundstebe, whom he considered his greatest friend and inspiration. We're honored this evening also to wel welcome the Norwegian Consul General, Ellen Ronlig, and her husband. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Olaf Orheim, was one of the, of Norway's most, is one of Norway's most eminent climatologists and glaciologists. Dr. Orheim has held leadership positions in a wide variety of international polar research organizations. He served as director of the Norwegian Polar Institute from 1993 to 2005. From 2005 to 2012, he headed the International Polar Year Program at the Research Council of Norway. He has also, been vice also served as vice president of the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research and was chair of the regional board of the International Arctic Science Committee, as well as chair of the Forum on the Arctic Research Operators and chair of the European Polar Board. He has completed more than 30 field seasons in the Arctic and Antarctic and authored over 80 research publications covering glacier mass balance and climate, ice dynamics, icebergs, remote sensing, and the politics of the polar regions. He's also written a book on Norwegian glaciers and um, innumerable articles. He is currently chairman of the United Nations Environment Program at Arendal, as well as chairman of the Norwegian Glacier Museum and the Polar Ship Fram Museum. Both museums well worth a visit. Um, as a bit of a footnote, among his many edu educational activities, he has conducted study tours of Svalbard and other Arctic destinations for prominent world leaders, notably the three heirs apparent to the thrones of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden all at once, and also in 2004, a delegation of U.S. senators that included Senator Hillary Clinton, Senator John McCain, and Senator Lindsey Graham, a couple of presidential contenders there. So he's a man of great influence, and we're very fortunate to have him with us again, once again. Once again, please welcome Dr. Olaf Orheim. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. After such an introduction, I feel it's quite hard to start talking. <clears throat> but um, I chose the title which uh, gave me some challenge, and I hope that I can now show later on that that uh, it's relevant. Uh, I'm no longer in any position of authority in Norway, and so I can speak my mind on any subject. <laughs> and, uh, but of course, I don't have the force of injury or the uh, whatever or word is in English. I can't do too much damage either. But I'm going to talk first a little bit about the Arctic. I have to do that, and I've talked about the Arctic here before, and I apologize 
to those of you who will recognize that some of the points are, have been made by me before, but I mean, that's the reality of life. I can't not say some things which are facts of life. But then I will talk about issues which are far more important and, and clearly are more active today than they were only a year ago, especially related to the Arctic Ocean and what's happening there. And then about the US uh, and what we expect of the US. And finally, an uh, issue which is becoming more apparent, and that is how is this what's happening so far north? How is that affecting us where we live? Um, but to start with then, just some basic facts. The Arctic, there are many ways to define the Arctic, but the most common way to define it is that it's that part of the world where the summer temperature is below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. In other words, it's a place where it's never very warm. And as you can see, most of it is north of the continent in, on the Eurasian side, but the northern part of Russia is in the Arctic, northern part of Norway also, a little bit maybe of Sweden and Finland, but then all of Iceland, large parts of Canada, and quite a bit of Alaska is that cold. Altogether in this area, only 4 million people live here. And out of those, only 8% are indigenous. We try to think that indigenous are the people of the Arctic, and of course they are. They're the ones who are adjusted to the Arctic. But indeed, uh, most of the people living up there look just like we do, so to speak. Uh, most of the indigenous uh, live uh, not very good lives, put it that way. I'm not going to talk much about them, but they don't have too much political power. The only place they really have much power uh, two places is in northern Canada, where some of the Inuit uh, tribes have uh, home rights and live and have the rights to land. And in Norway, the Sami people have rights which are special to them. Apart from that, they don't have any special things, even though in many of the countries they were the first, not necessarily in Scandinavia, but many of the others, they were the first to settle. If we take another look at this, a different way of looking at the a nighttime picture of the Arctic and see where the lights are. It's maybe not immediate obvious, which this is North America. Here we are. We are down here somewhere in New York now. Northern part, this is all the landmass, almost not a single light. If we go over to Europe, we see the lights along the coast of Norway. We go along Russia and the northern part, there practically nobody is living here. A little bit of Alaska. Here's a little bit of light in Alaska. This is not the place where many people live. And, of course, in the old days, it was not a place where many people or politicians, apart from those few who live up there, were not very much concerned with. I'm not going to talk about all these geographic areas, but just for those of you who are not regularly familiar with the Arctic, the Arctic Ocean is this land here surrounded by land masses, of which the Russia is by far the biggest. We have something called the Fram Strait between Spitsbergen and Greenland, and then we have Alaska, of course, over here, you know that, in Canada. And we have the Scandinavian countries on this side. Iceland, quite a bit further south, doesn't go that far north. Now, the Arctic Ocean, I'm going to get back to that, is now actually getting more and more important. And it's again shown here. And just to put this into perspective, it's about 1.5 time, times the size of the United States. And that's all of the United States, not just the contiguous United States. So it's a big area. It's about uh, five times the size of the Mediterranean. It is the smallest of the world's ocean, if we look upon the world's ocean being the Atlantic and Pacific and India and so forth, then it's small. But compared to these other things, it's a big area. And why has that not been on the scene? Well, basically because it's not been accessible. So, in the Cold War, all the way from 1950s, or even before the 1950s, and all the way up to about 1990, the Arctic Ocean, and that part of the Arctic right up to it, were completely out of the public scene. They were definitely very much on the scene, on thinking of the leadership in the US and in, uh, in Soviet Union. This was the most important area where they met in had actually military activities right next to each other. This was the time of the submarines. But because of that, 
nothing else was taking place up there, and nobody wanted to be up there to do something because there were so many restrictions from uh, all the parties involved. So it was a completely stable, completely predictable, and completely cold place. There was no warmth in the interactions, but on the other hand, there was a, a mutual respect, if you like, and a mutual understanding, especially if you look apart from the few t times of, of high tension, I think it's fair to say that both in the Soviet Union and in the US interest, nobody wanted to force anything onto the other. So there was a good understanding between the military of the balance, and the balance was so important. Because remember, the Soviet Union had no other second strike capability at that time, apart from the submarines. They had the silos with their rockets, just as the US did, but the US had two types of second strike capability. They also had the B-52 bombers that were flying around the Earth all the time. And those of you old enough, and older than me even, will remember Dr. Strangelove film uh, which was based a little bit on that B-52 thing. But this second strike capability was an important part of the understanding between the two superpowers at that time. Now, that changed all in the 1990s. It changed for many reasons. More importantly, that people actually started thinking in different terms uh, in relation to the military. But um, in the beginning of the 1990s, it was also changing because the Soviet Union went into, as we know it, into absolute uh, disintegration, but also into an uh, economic uh, demise. So that's setting the scene for where we are uh, today. And things started heating up, um, and I'll show you in a moment the climate part of it, and when we're getting into it, towards the end of the 1990s into the year 2000. And I've got the, some of the main points here. You can see the Arctic Ocean, of course, becoming warmer. Um, some of the Arctic, not all, becoming more accessible. Interesting, uh, uh, increasing interest from commercial actors. Uh, Russian Federation started to take new roles again. Some of them we don't like, like uh, Ukraine, but they were starting to become more active. And of course, new, completely new um, actors enter the, enter the scene in the Arctic. At the moment, there's no question that on Earth, the largest physical change taking place is the change in sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. We have no single phenomena of that dimension where it's taking place. Over the last few years, as I'll show you, the area has been reduced by half in, in, the, in the summertime. That's the same area as the, almost the same area as the size of the contiguous US. That's as much sea ice as that's appeared from up here. And if we look at this, we see here, uh, this is <coughs> early on, the records we have of sea ice in uh, some extent uh, have a fair amount of uncertainty because uh, there are not certainty in, in all the observations, but as we're getting on, from 1979 onwards, we have satellite observations, and as you can see, we have a remarkable decrease that started um, in the 1970s but have accelerated uh, even more so in the in the recent years. These are the changes now down to five or so million square kilometers, and up here we were about 11 square kilometers. Six million square kilometers is about the size, so a little bit less than the contiguous US. If we look at the absolute minimum, um, I have here, the since we started the satellite era, and I added 2015, the figure has not been made yet, and you can see that not every year goes down, but there's no question that the trend here, in fact, more realistically, it was a slow trend here, and then it started really speeding up into the mid-1990s. This is a remarkable change. And of course, it's being observed by all those working up there, or interested in working up there, are noting what's happening. If we look at this year, and I took this figure just from the map just a few days ago, sorry, Oops, get me this right. Here you see the sea ice extent on the 20th of September this year. And note if we were going shipping by a boat here which had no ice class at all, we could sail from the Bering Strait and we could sail north of all the Russian islands all the way around here and come out between Norway and Iceland here. We could also sail through the Northwest Passage, but as you can see, that's only just open, and it's a much more tricky way to go through. 
This phenomenon of sailing north of the islands is quite new. The first year we could do that was in 2012, so it's only three years ago. Here you see, and that was the absolute minimum so far of the observations. In uh, 17th of September in 2012, this is how much sea ice there was. The red is thick uh, and the, uh, the green is, is quite uh, thin. But again, you could sail north of all the islands, or north of Svalbard also, and come out here and down to Europe. Here's UK and, and uh, down to Amsterdam, if you like. This crossing of the Arctic Ocean north of Russia, well north of Russia, is no doubt going to be the most interesting way in the future should this uh, become more and more open. But we are not there yet. But the reduced ice then is giving new opportunities and new challenges. And um, that's what I will talk about a bit more. And first of all, shipping I've talked about in this uh, audience before, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. But there's a number of routes which are being now uh, calculated, so to speak. Uh, but as soon as we start talking about the routes across here, we start talking about territorial waters, and that I will talk a lot about. But this is the one way 